busy life, and I appreciate uh, yeah, the, the effort. Uh, yeah, I know it's, well, I'll say this to you, that what is at stake here is not the speaker or even the church, it's the material. And a Passion Week is uh, uh, very, very uh, obviously worth our attention. You know, oh, by the way, I sometimes, by the way, you know that uh, we have four gospel records of Jesus' life, and you know that not any of them is or claims to be an exhaustive telling of the life of Jesus, right? Every one of the four Gospels was writing to a specific audience. He was addressing a specific issue. He was developing a certain argument as he wrote the, uh, gave his telling of the, of, of the life of Jesus. All of that under the superintending ministry of the Spirit of God. But the point is that the, the, the four Gospels, they, they're, they're very selective. They're, they're, they're deliberately selective of what they include, what they emphasize, sometimes even the order in which they, uh, they narrate the stories and so on. And so it seems to me it's very significant that each of the four Gospels gives about 40% of his space to the last week of Jesus' life. So about two-fifths of each of the four Gospels is dedicated to these last eight days, really, of Jesus' life. Which means, number one, we can reconstruct this last week with a measure of detail and specificity that's not available to us for most of the rest of Jesus' life. Does that make sense? So yeah, we really can, can put the story together because we've got such, uh, such a careful record. And I think it also suggests to us the fact that each of the gospelists, superintended by the Spirit of God, gives that much attention to these uh, last days. It would certainly suggest that God is very, very anxious for us to know this story. Amen and amen. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to give much of the weekend, and uh, it'll be, uh, well, as God gives you uh, strength and ability, it'd be good to have you with us here, but... We're going to be focusing on this week, which we call the Passion Week. Where did we get that title, do you think? Why in the English-speaking world do we refer to the events surrounding Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as his passion? That doesn't seem necessarily intuitive, does it? Why? why? Got any idea? I, do, I, I have an idea, but I, I, not like I did any research. I, just, I think it might come from the fact, the way the King James... I like to say, any of you read the King James Bible and man enough to admit it? You know what I'm saying? But, but uh, no, the old King James translated Acts chapter 1. Dr. Luke says that Jesus showed himself alive after his passion. You remember that? By many infallible proofs. And that term, passion, has just, I think, pretty universally in the English-speaking world uh, taken to, used to refer to the events surrounding the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. And, and of course, in two weeks, we're going to celebrate that in a very special way at our, on Easter Sunday. So it's certainly appropriate. I can't imagine when and where it would not be appropriate. But this season of the year, it's certainly appropriate to focus on it in a very special way. And let me just, you, you have a set of notes. Now, the notes are rather extensive. There's a lot there. We're certainly not going to go through it line by line, trust me. But uh, it will be sort of the, uh, the outline which we use. Let me introduce you to a couple of, couple of elements of the notes. If you go to page one, there is a, a list of what I call 10 important insights. Now, I'm going to convene class here for a bit. So, but uh, I would just, I would invite you, I would uh, encourage you to just, as you have opportunity, maybe in the next couple of days, read over those. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of history here as God in his sweet and uh, kind providences has given me opportunity to teach on the life of Christ over the years. I, uh, I just came a time where I, I, I just realized, you know, there are certain realities that really leap off the, 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 the pages of the Gospels, which I think are sometimes overlooked, and they're, they're very, very basic to an understanding of Jesus' life as a whole. Now, these relate to the life of Jesus as a whole, but I just invite you to uh, maybe take a moment, read through them, and if you have any questions, write them down. I really would appreciate it if uh, either one-on-one or you, know, you bring things up during the time we have together, I'd love to talk about it. Now, on the second page, page two, there's a chart, and I'm going to come back to this chart in a little bit. 
But this chart is my attempt to sort of summarize the three and a half year ministry of Christ. And uh, there are a couple of elements of it that are really important to what we're going to pick up on when we're dealing with the Passion Week. So, again, you want to spend just a minute with that, perhaps. But, uh, and then on page three, I deal with the humanity of Jesus. Now, I'm going to go to the notes. Let me just say this to you, though, honestly. Uh, folks, the, uh, the I, I said it before, I can't imagine any topic would be, which would be more worthy of our careful attention than the events of this final week of Jesus' life. It is at once mortal life. It is at once the most awful and the most blessed week in all of human history. Amen and amen. It's the most awful because it seemingly culminates on Friday. Now, I always say, praise God, the Passion Week is an eight-day week, and we wouldn't be here this evening if it weren't. But, but there's going to be, it really culminates on that, on that second Sunday. But but it seems to culminate on, on the day when Jesus dies on the cross and the greatest miscarriage of justice, the, the, the greatest violation of all that is sacred and right and just in all of human history uh, unfolded there on that uh, hill on a gate just outside of a gate just north of Jerusalem. And it was so awful that God pulled a curtain of grayness across it to emphasize uh, the, 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 how wrong it was. On the other hand, it was the most blessed week in all of human history because of what was accomplished on that day. Amen and amen. Now, let me just say this by way of introduction that I'm going to dive. I, I have a PowerPoint. It kind of relates to the uh, uh, notes, so I'll take you there. But let me just say this, that uh, my concern, a couple over here, you know, uh, all, all too often today, frankly, the life of Jesus is studied as a sort of a, a, a series, not even necessarily a series, just a number of rather unrelated incidents and events in his life and so on. And that's not the way a person lives a life. You couldn't rearrange the events in your life haphazardly, and neither can you with Jesus. And I, I, I am so desperately anxious for you to really, maybe in ways you haven't before, understand the events of this final week as a drama, as a story. And it is all of that. And so rather than just pondering the uh, triumphal entry or the Garden of Gethsemane or, or the uh, upper room and so on, I, I want us to, to make it an unbroken story because the Bible lays it out that way. Now, let me uh, just go to my PowerPoint here, because there are a couple of points. Can you read that from afar? But I'll read it to you. The, the, there are a couple of points I want to make by way of introduction, and, and, and the first one is just that, that the only true source of our knowledge of the life of Jesus is the four Gospels, and a word concerning the integrity and accuracy of those documents. Let's stop on this for just a minute. Let me ask you something. You know, I mentioned earlier that there is no... No, no, no one, none of the Gospels pretends or, or, or set out to be an exhaustive telling. Every one of the Gospels is, is a selective record of Jesus' life, right? And yet, I think it is very much in our interest, and I think God is very anxious for us to do the work of comparing those four Gospels and weaving them together in such a way as to come away with as full and coherent a, a, a picture of the life of Jesus as we possibly can. So you take the four Gospels and you kind of lay them on top of each other and you find the points of overlap and intersection and synchronism and so on, and you weave together the story. What do we call that? What are we doing? Pardon me? We are, what are we doing to the Gospels? Harmonizing. You've heard that word. We are harmonizing the Gospels. Now, I don't want to get into this at all. I'll just tell you that there are many today who insist that that's an illegitimate effort. I absolutely reject that. But let me ask you this, and I want you to interact with me for just a minute here. Why, if it's important, and I believe it is, for, for us to understand the life of Jesus as a whole, 
Why four Gospels? Why did not God just give us one unbroken story? Take the work out of it. Now you just got the story laid out for you. We don't have that. And each one of the Gospels, by the way, deserves to be studied on its own as a book with its own. But once you've done that, then you combine, you harmonize the four. Why? Anybody? Pardon me? All right, I think that's very important. Each of the four gospelists take, has his own perspective. And I think it's fair to say that even given the superintending and enabling ministry of the Spirit of God, no one artist could have painted the portrait that God knew we needed to have. And so you have these four, which are, which are giving you these distinctive, always entirely in agreement and so on, pictures of Jesus. I think there's more. Anybody else? Why four gospels? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Stephen mentioned that that uh, uh, it it sort of tests our our commitment to understand it because now there is that extra effort. All right. Let, one, one other point I want to draw. Anybody? Yeah. Four testimonies. See, I think that more than anything else is what's the heart of it. Folks, I'm, I'm, I'm setting you up for something. Let me just tell you, and this is so important, and if you've not deliberately cogitated this, I want you to think about it for a moment and file it away where you can get at it because it's important to understand that your faith, the faith of the Bible, is grounded in real history. Now, it's, it's impossible to overstate how important that is. You know, because, again, Why? Because it makes, you know what it does? It makes the claims of the Judeo-Christian faith falsifiable. If you could prove that those historical events didn't happen, what? See the point? If he need be not risen, this is all in vain. That's what Paul says. He's talking about a historical event when Jesus came back from the dead. Now, folks, most religions are the function of some supposed, uh, supposedly insightful thinker who, you know, had grand metaphysical thoughts and sat in a hill somewhere, maybe with a big tummy, you know, and had these thoughts and shared them. What in the world? You can't test that. Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, the faith of the Bible. Let me tell you something. The, all right, if you and I are going to know God, God has to take the initiative. Amen and Amen. Because we got these two problems. We are twice crippled. Number one, we are finite, so we could not discover an infinite God. Number two, we are fallen, so we are fleeing from that God. So God has to take the initiative if we are going to know him. He has done that, bless his name. And when he does, we call it revelation. What's the Greek word for revelation? Everybody in the room knows it. You know what I'm saying? What's the Greek, what's the other name for the last book of the Bible? The apostle. Apocalypse, right? And apocalypsis means unveiling. That's what it is. Revelation is God unveiling. Now, here's, here's a little theology lesson, and this is, this is extra, but this is important. All through sacred history, you can trace it in the Bible, folks. This is what God does. Whenever God reveals himself, he, he does it in two steps. First of all, there is event revelation. And this is where God breaks into human history. He, I like to say he perpendicularizes himself to human history. And you get water uh, standing, you know, walls of water in the Red Sea. You get bread falling out of heaven. You get walls falling out of Jericho. You get people being raised from every, every sort of sickness. This is event. These are miracles. This is God interjecting himself into human history in a most real, undeniable way. Now, that's never enough. After event revelation, there is always word revelation. Because God always raises up a spokesman. In the Old Testament, we call that spokesman a prophet. In the New Testament, we call him an apostle. And you know, those spokesmen have two obligations. Number one, they record the event revelation. And number two, I don't know if you can even read this, they interpret the event revelation. 
How well would we understand the work of salvation if we had Matthew, but we didn't have Romans? See where I'm taking you here? Now, folks, what, 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 what's the significance here? Your faith is grounded in real history. This is real history. Again, God in his sweet providence has given me opportunity to take people to Israel, and I love doing it. And one of the reasons I love doing it most is because it has the effect, almost wit uh, unwittingly on so many people, of absolutely, uh, absolutely getting all these biblical stories out of the Peter Pan and Easter Bunny category. You know what I'm saying? This is real. This is history. Does that make sense to you? Now, let me tell you something about history. Write this down somewhere. I'm teasing. <laughs> Most of it happened a long time ago. Can we all agree on this? What's it got to do with anything? Now, just think. Now, I'm, I'm, I, you think I forgot the question. The question is, why four Gospels? And the answer that was offered is that four testimonies. What kind of testimonies do you suppose? Historical. Eyewitness. Four testimonies. See, see. This is what you need to understand. Here, three simple points. Number one, your faith is grounded in history. Number two, that history happened a long time ago. And number three, and this is huge, the historical truth claims absolutely basic to the Judeo-Christian faith are bizarre. They include really, really strange claims, like that a man died on a Roman cross, his body was laid in a tomb, and three days later he came out alive and showed himself alive for 40 days. Now, why should you believe that? Well, I'm going to give all the credit ultimately to the, to the Spirit of God, but let me tell you, the Spirit of God doesn't ask you to leap into some abyss of irrationality and, 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 and silliness. The fact is, the reason, now watch this, that those, let's take the Gospels. The reason the, the, the historical truth claims of the Gospels are absolutely dependable is because they were recorded by eyewitnesses, by four, by, by, actually by dozens of eyewitnesses. The biblical standard is this, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. Now that's a jurisprudential canon, but, but it applies here exactly. And the fact is, think about this, and I'll just leave it alone. The first gospel written, and if you want to argue about this, I'd be happy to, but the first gospel written was Matthew. And I would argue on the base of Acts 12 and some patristic evidence that Matthew was probably written by about 44 A.D. Jesus died on April 3rd, 33 A.D. He ascended to the Father some 40 days and more later, in 33 A.D. The Gospel of Matthew was written, now watch this, and circulated. And by the way, could I tell you this? When the Gospel of Matthew was written, it was, it was understood to be, by the earliest Christian, the, the, our, the, the church fathers, they understood it to be a work not just of Matthew, but of a collaborative work of all 12 of the Apostles the twelfth being Mattathias, which, is, I'm sorry, Matthias in Acts chapter 1. And if you read in Acts chapter 1, verse 21, when Peter is overseeing the selection of a replacement for Judas, remember this? You remember the, the, the qualification he lays down? He says it has to be somebody who went in and out with us from the baptism of John in order that he might be witness to the resurrection. Now, think about this. Folks, honest to goodness, <laughs> I get lost in this. But, you know, the hubris of modernity. We, 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 we think we're the only clever people who ever lived. And those people in antiquity, they were so superstitious and pre-critical. And, and they went for anything, so they didn't really check. Baloney. Baloney. It's, it's, so, it's so wrong. People think, that, you know, in that day, you know, somebody comes and says, you know what? I was dead, but I, I, I'm back from the dead. And, and everybody's just going to say, fine, let's go have lunch. You know, No, sir. People didn't raise from the dead back then any more than they do today. 
and the claim that the Nazarene died, and we're going to talk about this in the course of the conference this weekend, on a, on, on a Roman cross. Everybody in the wide Roman world knew that if you were ever nailed to a Roman cross, you weren't coming down until you were a dead person. And that's how he died, and yet he showed himself alive. That's, that's, you know what that is? You know what that is? I'm the only guy in the world that knows how, and I, forgive me, only guy I would say in the speak, English-speaking world who can still use this term. It's incredible. Now, I know incredible means swell to everybody, but it actually means something. And it means unworthy of belief. I won't talk you out of using it the other way, but uh, I hear people say, oh, man, that was an incredible sermon, I think. Wouldn't it be just as good for a sermon to be credible when you think about it? I mean, wouldn't that be? But at any rate, uh, no, I, my, my point is that the claim that, that, that the Nazarene died on a Roman cross and then showed himself alive is an absolutely incredible claim. It's unworthy of belief. Unless, you know, by the way, I think, well, I don't think. <laughs> The word witness, when we read in the book of Acts the word witness, you should be witnesses, we think of it in the terms of sharing the faith, which is, which is good. But that's not really what it's talking about. It's talking about eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why the 12th apostle selected there in Acts chapter 1 had to be somebody. Now think about this. Now I'm going to leave it alone. Just get one minute. Had to be somebody who had gone, who had known Jesus well from the baptism of John. Why is that? Think about this. <laughs> if you had only met Jesus of Nazareth during the 40 days of his resurrection ministry, could you be a credible, court-worthy witness? No, you could be an imposter. You don't know this guy. It needs to be somebody who, you know, I always think, if I'm living in Nazareth and I've lived there all my life, and I knew this uh, Joseph and his family very, very well. And uh, Joseph and Mary and their kids, and I've known them all my life. And, you know, I, I, I went to uh, synagogue school with young Jesus when he was a boy. And, and I watched, and I, I'm still mad about what he did to the curve maybe, you know, at school. But then I, 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 I uh, you know, I watched as he grew up and apprenticed to his father and as a, uh, hold on to your seats, gentlemen, a stonemason. He almost certainly was a stonemason. The word that's used of Joseph is technon, which means, tecton, which means um, builder. But in Israel, you don't build with wood. There's no wood in Israel, so you build with stone. That probably, but anyway, I, you know, I'm living here in Nazareth, and, and I've known this family, and I can remember when, when Jesus, strangely enough, took his family and moved to Capernaum, and I heard about all this excitement, and then, again, I just live in here in Nazareth, I heard that he went and got himself crucified by the Romans. My goodness. But then I heard strange rumors that people insist he'd come back from the dead. Now, I'm just making this up as I stand here, quite obviously. But here's my point. So the day comes when Jesus comes back to the village of Nazareth and is standing before me. Now again, I knew him all of his life. So how are you going to react? See, I'm going to react something like this, honestly. I'm going to say, you could be Jesus. You really, really look like Jesus. And maybe everybody's standing around saying, no, it is Jesus. I'm, no, 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 because Jesus died. He died on a Roman cross. And once you're dead, you're a dead person. So I, it can't be Jesus, but it looks like Jesus. And finally, I'm going to say something like this. All right, you claim to be Jesus. See that tree over there, right in the middle of town? Remember the eight-year-old boy who fell out of that tree and broke his arm one spring day? Tell me the name of that boy. You see what I'm saying? I'm going to be checking to make sure this is really because people don't come back from the dead. Does that make sense to you? Now, let me, let, me, let me draw it all together. You have these fourfold, now more than that, but you have multitudinous eyewitnesses reflected in the four Gospels. They're all telling the same story. They have their distinctions and so on. But it's, it's in the mouth of two or three. And, and, and let me go back to Matthew. Because not only, I would say that it was not only written, I mean, it was written by about 44 A.D., and it was circulated in the very place where the stories could be falsified. Does that make sense to you? 
think about how important this is, folks. I'm, I'm going to leave it alone. But, you know, uh, there's, a, there's an important Bible commentator. We all know him. Uh, really kind of a naturalist, a functional believer. But anyway, his name is William Barclay. This is Barclay's telling <coughs> excuse me, of the feeding of the 5,000. He says, probably what happened is that there in a plain of Bethsaida that day, there were a lot of people, and Jesus realized they needed to eat, and so he gave the command, and, and his disciples were flummoxed, but they didn't know what to do, and finally this little boy came out and offered the five loaves and two fishes, and when everybody in the crowd saw the little boy be generous, everybody in the crowd said, well... I wasn't going to say anything, but I brought my lunch too. So they all got out their lunch, and they shared it with their neighbors. And by the time it was done, there was plenty of one around, and even some left over. Now, that's his telling. He says, well, time went by, and it got blown out of proportion, but that's probably what happened. All right, now listen. If Matthew wasn't written, as we're told again and again, it wasn't written until sometime late in the first century, maybe around 90 A.D., all those people are dead and gone. But what about if it's written and circulated about 44? And most of those 5,000 people are still alive. And if all that happened there that afternoon was everybody got generous, then when somebody reads that scroll and it says that Jesus multiplied the loaves, they're going to say, come on, give me a break. I was there that day. It was a nice day, but no miracle. No. And, 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 and by the way, not only is, is, are the Gospels circulated, especially Matthew, for 30 years, that was, every, everywhere Paul went, he had one book tucked up under his arm, and that was the scroll of Matthew. And, but the point is that not only what is it circulated when there were still thousands of people who could put the lie to it, but it was circulated at a time when there was an unbelieving Jewish community that was desperate to discredit that story. So what I'm saying to you is this. Why four Gospels? You have these four Gospels. They have been scrutinized and analyzed and attacked and critiqued for hundreds and hundreds of years. They've proven themselves absolutely consistent with one another. And there has never been the first historical misstatement ever proven in those Gospels. And your faith, the faith with regard specifically now, the life and death and burial and resurrection and ascension of the Savior, is based on absolutely unimpeachable historical sources. Does that make sense to you? So know that your faith is grounded in history, and God has been careful to record that history and, and preserve it for us. All right, well, uh, now, a second random point here. Folks, you have a couple of pages, beginning on page 3, I think it is, on the humanity of Jesus. Let me talk about this for a couple of minutes to you. I'm not going to go through these pages. Uh, the pages are laid out rather carefully simply because, well, uh, uh, first of all, let me tell you this. Honest to goodness, folks, it is my observation, and I, and I, and I, I don't mean to, no, I do mean to challenge you here, as a matter of fact, but I, I, I don't want to do it insultingly, but because uh, I don't know. You're, you're, we're brand new friends. But I'll tell you something. It's my observation that all too often Christians, and, and I'm thinking of really mature, deliberate, serious, Bible-studying Christians, that Christians underappreciate the genuine humanity of Jesus Christ. And, and let me say quickly, I don't mean that they underappreciate Jesus' humanity in terms of their doctrinal commitment. Because you read any doctrinal statement, statement of faith, which has any, any pretense, whatever, to orthodoxy, it's going to have a plank that says Jesus was God, very God. He was man, very man. Amen and amen, right? So certainly we all embrace it with full throat with regard to the, this is what the Bible teaches. And by the way, th that's staggering because the point of, in, in point of fact, that is bottomlessly mysterious. But what I mean is this. When I say that Christians undervalue, I mean in terms of the way we actually read the stories of Jesus' life. And as we read this or that account in Jesus' life, and I'm going to beg you to rethink this and to perhaps rather consciously recalibrate your head in a little bit. In a, in a bit of a way. Uh, because as we read the stories in Jesus' 
ministry, as we read them in the Gospels, I think we tend to conceive of Jesus as living out this or that story on a plane entirely other than where we live. It's sort of a hovercraft existence he lived. Because after all, he was the guy. You know what it is? And I, don't, I mean this, I say this carefully. I don't mean it to be offensive. But it's sort of a Clark Kent approach to Christology. You know what I'm saying? There never was a Clark Kent. Right? Are we all on board with that story? <laughs> that was Superman pretending. But hey, did you grow up on Superman comic books? Man, I grew up on those things. And, and I can see right now, I, I can see Clark Kent, you know, he's off flying around with a cape and carrying Lois, but as soon as he puts those glasses on, she never saw him before. This is just Clark Kent, you know. And, and he's walking down the street, and here's the bank, and there are robbers in the bank, and, and a little beam comes out of his glass. Remember that? He's looking through the wall. Now, you don't know it. You don't know it, but he's looking through the wall, and he knows what's going on in there. The robbers are robbing the bank, you know. You know what I'm talking about? So it's Clark Kent is Superman deliberately perpetuating the illusion that he's just Clark Kent. And I think sometimes we, we, we read the stories of Jesus' life and we kind of witlessly assume that Jesus, well, that, that Jesus is just, just perpetuating the illusion that he's man. But really, he's always in full exercise of all sorts of attributes which distinguish him entirely. So his life is nothing like ours. All right, let me get real close to home here. <laughs> the big issue here, quite honestly, is omniscience. God is omniscient. Jesus is God. Therefore, I heard a preacher one time, and I have beat up on this poor guy for years, but he said it, and I've used it. See, he said, he said, uh, uh, the, the, the difficulty in arguing with Jesus is this, that he always knew exactly what you were going to say before you said it. Well, and uh, by the way, when he, when he was talking about that, he was talking about Jesus at 12. That's, he was actually talking about the Luke 2 experience. So Jesus already knew everything you were going to say before you said it, and, I, and I'm saying to myself, all right, let's ask two questions. I don't know if this is helpful, but uh, number one, might he have? Did he have the intrinsic power to do that? I, I think he did. Here's the other question. Did he? Is there indication in the scriptures that Jesus had to ask questions? Could Jesus be, hold on to your hats, ignorant of something? Well, absolutely he could and was. Uh, he had to ask honest questions. You know, there is a, and now I'm beating up on you here, but there is a uh, very late, very Gnostic, very heretical, very uh, blasphemous, purported gospel of Jesus' infancy from about the third century, which says that when Jesus was born, as his mother was wrapping him in swaddling clothes, he looked up at her and said, handle me carefully, I'm the son of God. Well, that took some of the fun out of Christmas, didn't it? <laughs> Folks, think about it. It's not accidental to humanity to be born pre-sentient, right? You have to grow in to adult understanding. I mean, mature understanding. If a baby is born speaking to its mother as it emerges from the womb, it's not a human baby. It's an alien or something. That's not a human baby. Can we agree on that? So clearly, Jesus had to learn. He had to grow. He had to discover who he was. That's what it is to be human. Now, let me just say this. There, you're saying to yourself, well, wait a minute. Jesus encountered a woman at a well in Sychar and knew that she had five husbands. Amen and amen. Met a man under a fig tree. Knew his name was Nathaniel. Amen and amen. Peter knew because the Spirit of God informed him that Ananias and Sapphira were lying to him. Remember that? We don't jump from there to the idea that Peter lived his whole life that way. We recognize that at that time, the Spirit of God ministered that understanding. Folks, this is so important. And if I'm, if I'm, if I'm shocking you here, be patient with me, but this is so important. 
Jesus was every bit as dependent upon the Spirit of God as you and I are. And it's as the Spirit of God directed Jesus to employ, if you don't know his, um, if you don't mind, it, to, or, or, or empowered him to, to know these things that he knew him. But folks, honest to goodness, and this is so plain in the Scriptures. You know, I asked the question, could Jesus be ignorant of anything? Well, think about when he went to raise Lazarus from the dead. And this, this always strikes me. We've got to get to this before the night's over. Right? Well, at least by tomorrow morning. But the, uh, now we've got to get it to it tonight, Bookman. Pay attention. Uh, the, uh, remember what happened? He comes from Perea and, 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 and Martha encounters him. Martha, Lazarus' sister, she, you should have been here. He wouldn't have died. He's going to rise again. Oh, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection. No, I want him now. Oh, wait, I am the resurrection of life. Do you believe this? So that's that. And the next statement out of Jesus' mouth after he says, I am the resurrection. Do you believe this, Martha? And she says, I believe that thou art the Christ, the living God. Next thing Jesus says is, where have they laid him? Now, had the Spirit of God directed Jesus to know that, he wouldn't have been asked that. But because the Spirit of God didn't. I know some people say, well, he was just making conversation. You can't do that. It's an honest question. And besides that, you women ought to cherish that passage, I always say, because Jesus was willing to ask for directions, you know what I'm saying? I'd, I'd wander around all afternoon. No, don't tell me I can't find that tomb, for heaven's sake. Another, another one that, that always strikes me, and, and think about this, is when Jesus encountered that fig tree on Monday morning. He's coming into Jerusalem from Bethany, and he sees that fig tree, and by reason of the horticulture of the land and the day, uh, it had leaves, the, 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 the summer leaves had come, so the winter fruit should be there, and the winter fruit was nightly and not worth harvesting, and uh, was often used to snack on in the morning, and so Jesus goes over and, 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 and to get some figs. Now, be patient with me. I think you got two choices here, and only two. One is, and I think people kind of witlessly read it this way, but when I spell it out, I don't think you want to go here. One is that Jesus sees the tree, and he says, now, of course, because I'm God, which he is, and because I'm always in full exercise of my omniscience, which I don't believe he is, I know that there are no figs on that tree, but I have a point to make, so I'm going to go over there and pretend to be looking for figs because there are leaves, and then I'm going to pretend to be a little upset when there are no figs, and so on. You don't believe Jesus lived that way. So what are the options? He was schnookered by the fig tree, just like you and I would have been. So the fact of the matter is, and... and, and one of, the, one of the specific reasons that I'm so anxious for us, and I'm going to come to it in just a few moments, it, to, to come to grips with this is, is that, you know, in Matthew chapter 10, as a matter of fact, it's my next point, I think. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus makes a command of his disciples. It's a very important and fascinating command. It's in the commission where he's sending out the 12, two by two, well into the Galilean ministry. And he says to them, he says, behold, I am the one sending you. In the Greek, it's twice apparent that the emphasis is this. I'm the one sending you. He says this, behold, I am sending you as sheep in the midst of, the, of wolves, therefore. But the therefore relates to the one who is doing the sending. The Greek is very plain. Behold, because I'm the one sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. If you're, if you're, you need to reflect who I am, therefore, because I'm the one sending you. You must be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And the word that Jesus uses there for wise is not the normal New Testament word or actually New Testament and Old Testament informed word for skillful living, what we think of wisdom literature and so on. It's a word that means clever, scheming, one might say, conniving, as long as you understand that he balances out by saying wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And so Jesus commanded of his disciples that they be clever, that they be resourceful, that they be strategic, that they, they plan their ministry and husband their resources so as to uh, make full proof of the assignment they're given, so as to put their enemy to every disadvantage and so on. So, and, and yet, in all of that, be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Never violate any principle of morality, ethics. Can I just tell you something here in the middle? We have that same commission. 
We have no right to be careless with the resources God gives us in any area of life, but especially the spiritual responsibilities he gives us. We need to be so, we need to be wise. Well, the fact is Jesus was that perfectly. And I just love to trace the ways in which Jesus plans his ministry. And I don't mean in some sovereign way, because people do get the idea that because Jesus is the God-man, he just walks into the room and everybody becomes automatically robotized, you know, and they got to whatever, you know, everything just has to. No, no, Jesus lived a real life. He lived a life so stunningly like yours that he can be a high priest who is touched with the feeling of your infirmities. And Jesus had to be clever, and we're going to see some of that. So I'm saying to you, I would beg of you, take very seriously and and I, uh, the, the the humanity of Je the real now i give you on page 4 cuz i think this is a good spiritual exercise uh, with all of that discussion i started to say that i give you a lot of notes because quite frankly folks and i'm happy to talk with you but i'm telling you i'm going to arm wrestle with you if you if you accuse me of this because again and again people think that i'm playing fast and loose with jesus deity when we celebrate his humanity no no there's not a man in the world who ever believed more thoroughly and understood, I think, absolutely committed to the reality that Jesus is God, very God. But the Bible says he is also man, very man. And let me just say, I made mention of this just briefly a moment ago, but let me just say this. There is bottomless mystery in that. One of the, one of the, let me take two minutes, one of the dynamics of Jesus' ministry, which you've got to deliberately factor in to the drama as you read it. One of the dynamics is the almost unimaginable difficulty of bowing the knee to what Jesus is claiming concerning himself. Now I say this as one of those ten, those ten insights, but everywhere Jesus went throughout his ministry, he made two claims concerning himself. And I'm not making this up. He claimed to be the Christ. He claimed to be the long-awaited, much-promised deliverer. First of all, promised in Genesis 3.15, that seed of woman who's going to undo the curse. And all throughout the Old Testament, this promised deliverer, we're told more and more about him and made to be more and more excited about him. Jesus claimed to be that. Now let me just say this. This is a little seminary business. But in the Old Testament, the word Mashiach, anointed one, Messiah, is not a real important word. I mean, it's an important word, but it's not one. There are just scores of pictures and words and terms and so on that are used to anticipate this coming deliverer. Messiah is one of them. It's not a big one. But during the intertestamental period, during the 400 years between Matthew, uh, Malachi and Matthew, that one term in the Jewish mind came to sweep together everything the Old Testament said about that coming deliverer. So the Messiah... King. Jesus claimed to be that king, right? He also claimed to be God come in the flesh. Now, again and again, when, when Jesus gets his disciples, for instance, I'm going to say again and again, this, I'm not making it up. When Jesus gets his disciples up to the region of Caesarea Philippi and said, remember this, Matthew 16? says, whom do you say that I am? And their answer was, you remember Peter speaking, thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. When, I just mentioned it, when Martha, when Jesus, in that, hor that hugely emotional moment where Martha is getting after Jesus for allowing her husband, her, her brother, I'm sorry, to die, and Jesus, no, he's going to rise again. Do you, I, I, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And what comes spilling out of her heart and soul in that emotionally laden moment is, Master, I believe you are the Christ, the son of the living God. When Caiaphas, Got Jesus on trial on Friday morning, very, very early. We'll talk about it uh, tomorrow. G he said to him, tell us plainly, are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? And then perhaps most importantly, John writes a gospel. And he concludes the gospel with a purpose statement in 20, 31, uh, 30 and 31 where he says, many other signs did Jesus which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now listen to this. Can you finish that verse? And that believing, you might have life through his name. Jesus made those two claims. If you rejected them, you rejected life. That's serious stuff. 
Now, what you got to understand is that, number one, Jesus claimed to be Messiah was beyond what it is easy for us to appreciate disappointing. Oh, I'd love to develop that. It shows up again and again in the narrative of the Gospels. What a difficult, it was so difficult because they were looking for a warrior Messiah. They were looking for a Messiah, and they had a right to do that. Here comes this, this, this artisan, this stonemason artisan out of the most despised village in all of Nazareth, and he's got no army. He's just got those, he's got those uh, disciples. He's not calling on men to rebel, but to repent, and 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 claims to be the Messiah. Oh, he, you want to know? You want to know? I shouldn't do this, but you want to know how disappointing he was. One of the most astounding pericopes in the Gospels or events in the Gospels is when John the Baptist is languishing in a Roman prison and Messiah Jesus does nothing to deliver him and he sends messengers to ask, what? Are you the one who should come? This is John the Baptist. He watched the dove descend. He heard the voice. But he just, he was staggered when, when, when Jesus did not exercise political dominion over the Romans. It's, it's tough. But that was the easy one. Because he claimed, number one, to be God, uh, Messiah, then he claimed to be God come in the flesh. Now, folks, honest to goodness, this is a healthy exercise. Just contemplate for a moment what it must have been like in that day. You know, we've had a couple of thousand years to get used to this. And it kind of rolls off of our tongue. Jesus is God, very God. Amen and amen. Let's go have lunch. Well, okay. I'm glad it's intuitive and and uh, non-negotiable to us. But I do think there's virtue in just trying to imagine what it must have been like to have a man stand before you. And he comes to a Jewish audience. You know, the Jews, all of their history were surrounded by pagan peoples who had dozens of gods, and the gods lived on a big hill outside of town, and those gods were nothing but men blown big. All throughout the Scriptures, especially the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, God reveals himself again and again as holy, set apart. And the idea is there that he's ontologically holy. He's, set, he's transcendent. He's not part of this created order. Those pagan gods are nothing but men, imaginary men blown big. God is not a man. If there's anything a Jewish person knows, it's this. Yahweh is not a man. And yet here's a man standing before me claiming to be God. How would you react how would we react if somebody made that claim today? I mean, if I were to say to you, and I don't even like to say this out loud, but, I, you know, I've been doing a little thinking. I think maybe I'm, I'm God. How do you do, you, do you, do you sit down and say, well, let's talk about it, Buckman. Let's think it through, you know. Could be, I guess. No, you don't let me play with sharp things, for heaven's sakes, literally. <laughs> you put me somewhere where I'll be safe from myself. You know, by the way, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus' own family comes to take him home, thinking him to be mad. That's a function of this claim. You might say, well, wait a minute, Buck. If you make that claim, well, there's no reason to believe it. But when Jesus made the claim, it wasn't that hard because I've seen pictures. And Jesus had a halo, and you don't have halos, right? <laughs> no, no, I always say, Jesus didn't have a halo. He didn't glow in the dark. He was a man. He was everything. Now, he's unfallen. Amen and amen. But he was a man. And to have a man standing before you in a Jewish audience claiming to be God come in the flesh is absolutely breathtaking. And you have to factor that in. But that's for another time. So come way back to me. My point is simply this, and I have a couple points on the screen there, but I would just implore you, number one, here, here, let me, let me just suggest this spiritual exercise. I think our impulse when we are reading this or that story from the life of Jesus is to kind of quietly, witlessly, and I think mistakenly and cripplingly, but to kind of quietly assume that Jesus is living that experience out at a level on a plane different from our own because he has special secret powers and so on. Unless there's something in a given narrative to kind of bring us back to earth and remind us of his humanity. So we kind of got to get it jerked back to, I would implore you, deliberately, do it the other way around. Always assume 
that Jesus is living this or that event out within the limitations of unfallen humanity, unless there's something in the narrative that makes it absolutely clear that the Spirit of God directed him to employ his divine attributes. That makes sense to you? Because I'm telling you, that's how he lived his life. Does that make sense to you? Test case real quickly. Everybody knows this story. Man let down through the roof. You see, this is the way it happens. Of course, Jesus, man let down through, he looks at him and he says, thy sins be forgiven thee. Well, on the front row there are a bunch of Pharisees and he's baiting those Pharisees. And the Pharisees, the Bible says, began to murmur among themselves. And then, and then both Matthew and Mark say something like this. So Jesus, knowing their thoughts. Now, don't misunderstand me. Maybe so. But I think immediately we think Jesus, bzzz, oh, I know what's going on. He can do that. I mean, if the Spirit of God directs him to. But I'm just asking you, do you need that in that narrative? Jesus is deliberately baiting them. Thy sins be forgiven. He looks over here, they go, blah, blah, blah. I could have figured out what they were talking about, for heaven's sake. And I'll tell you another side of it, honest to goodness. I like this side of it. I think Jesus was blindingly intuitive. I think he could read you like a book absent any omniscience. Why? Because he knew man. He had immersed his mind and soul spirit with the Old Testament. And he knew man because he had learned from the, old, from the scriptures who man is and how men react and what influences man and so on. And so I think Jesus was blindingly intuitive, absent any appeal to omniscience, which happens on occasion. All right, so I'm going to leave it alone. Uh, <coughs> one other reality, and then we're going to take a short break, but I don't want to lose you entirely. But on page two, you have this chart. And I want to take just a quick moment with this chart. Uh, I could get it up here, but you have it in front of you. Listen, there's only one point I want to make. If you look on the left-hand side, you'll see those shaded boxes. And the top two, uh, do I have it right here? Good. The first one I call public presentation. Now listen, here's the point. For the first, here, here, real quickly. You have noticed that there are times when Jesus does a miracle and then says, tell everybody what I've done. There are other times, many of them, when he says, please don't tell anybody what's going on there. More than one uh, thing, but, but let me say the most important dynamic is this right here. Because for two and a half years, Jesus gave himself methodically, strategically, perseveringly to what I call their public presentation. What do I mean? He is offering himself to that generation of Israel as their long-awaited Messiah. And he goes where they are. He makes those claims deliberately. He works so many miracles because that's how you prove your right to make that claim, that you are a divine messenger and so on. <coughs> and there are two grand moments of rejection. I give them to you there. Unpardonable sin, the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus recognizes that that generation had steeled itself so thoroughly that no matter what evidence he offered them, they were not going to repent. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus, I believe, knew from the scriptures that, that he was going to be rejected and he was going to suffer. But he made a genuine, loving, persevering, convincing offer of himself as Messiah. And, they, the, and so about a year before, about, about 13 months actually, before he dies, well, I should, I should say the other way. Uh, after about two and a half years, Jesus uh, changes his tactics from what I'm calling their public presentation to private preparation because, and here's where I'm taking you on the, sh on the, on the screen even. For the first almost three years of a three and a half year ministry, Jesus never spoke concerning dying. When he did... For the first time, Matthew 16, verse 21, about seven months before he died, very close to seven months, when he first, for the first time, told his disciples he was going to die, Matthew 16, 21, how did they react? Do you remember? 
They were horrified. They were scandalized. They were mad about it. Matter of fact, Matthew 16, 21 says this, From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must be taken to Jerusalem, suffer, suffer many things of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day rise again. And the next verse says that Peter took him. Now, most have took him aside, like, you know, we need to talk about this. I think he took him like this. I think he grabbed him probably by the lapel, said, far be it. Don't be talking that way. And you need to understand, and I'm asking you to bring with you, uh, as we consider the, the events of the Passion Week, this reality, that though Jesus told them again and again that he was going to die, they never got it. And they were absolutely clueless as they entered the upper room. Matter of fact, I'll argue tomorrow that I think they were quite clearly anticipating Jesus handing out kingdom assignments. I think they thought the kingdom was about to be inaugurated. And, and, and Jesus knows he's, he's on his way to his death. So just know this as a, as a bald fact, that the Bible could not, you can see it in Luke 18, 31 to 34, most dramatically perhaps, but the disciples never got it. And, and, and as an index of how thoroughly they never got it, one of the curious realities is that every time in the record Jesus told them he was going to die in the next breath, same breath, he said, on the third day I'll rise again. And one might have thought that maybe just one or two of them would have heard that, and after he did die, would have put it together and said, well, let's go hide behind a tree somewhere and see what happens. No. When the women came telling of the empty tomb, they said, you're crazy. You know, it's curious. It, it, it wasn't the death of Jesus that talked him into believing that. It was the resurrection. It took the resurrection. It's staggering. And, and uh, I don't want to beat up on him. It's, it's, all right, well, let me leave it at that. And uh, then I want to go to uh, some events before the week. So it's just 8.03. Let's take, let, be back here at 8.10, okay? Stretch, get something to drink, like water. And then, and then uh, 8, 8, 8, 10, we'll go back to work. Matter of fact, I'll go back to work and you drift in if, if it comes to that. For the, uh, for the Passion Week. And I mean, I think very deliberately in God's purposes. And so I want to I look at those. Take your Bible, first of all, and go to uh, Luke chapter uh, 18. I'm sorry, 13. What am I talking about? Luke chapter 13. Now listen, there's a lot here, and so uh, I'm just going to be very cursory, but what happens is this. Some months before the, uh, before the Passover, before the events of Jesus' passion, Jesus goes to Jerusalem for a feast called the Feast of Dedication. We know it as Hanukkah in December. He's going to die in April. So in December, he goes to Jerusalem and that's John 10 and verse 22. And while he's there at Jerusalem, he makes the claim to be one with the Father, and his enemies, the Pharisees at this time, pick up stones to stone him. And therefore, because Jesus is wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, he, he, he betakes himself to Perea. Now, he's in Perea, which is on the far side of the Jordan River. It's on the east side of the Jordan River. Perea is under the uh, jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. And while he is there, the Pharisaic leaders of Jerusalem come and they try to lure him back into Jerusalem. Now, I've got to be quick here. I do have some notes here on the screen about this. I'm not going to... I, how much geography do you know? Get to know your Bible geography. In Jesus ministry. In the days of Jesus' ministry, there are two primary Roman officers that we need to know. One is Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, this is really important. Pontius Pilate, his jurisdiction is Judea and Samaria, all right? On the other hand, and, and Pontius Pilate is a crippled Roman ruler. He has used up all of his coupons back there in Rome, he served at the uh, whim and will of the Roman Caesar, who was uh, Tiberius. And uh, 
uh, and, 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 and Pontius Pilate ruled over Judea, and Judea was entirely Jewish. So know this, without spending a lot of time, just know this as a bald fact, it's, it's important, that the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea could get Pilate to dance to the tune they piped. Does that make sense to you? They really, they've got leverage over Pilate. That's what they're going to use. That's how they're finally going to get Jesus dead. On the other hand, to the north and to the east, in Galilee to the north and Perea to the east, there's Galilee, there's Perea. So that area there is the province of Herod Antipas. Now this is not, Herod the Great is a dead guy. Herod the Great is the fellow who built the temple and who conquered this territory and so on. He died... 1 B.C., by the way, you're going to read 4, but I'm convinced 1. But at any rate, when he died, he left his kingdom to three of his sons. One of them was Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas rules. He's very, very effective. He's going to rule until 39. He's finally going to be deposed. But he rules in, uh, in, in uh, Galilee to the north and Perea to the east, just as you see there. Well, Jesus knows that he is in the greatest danger in Judea. You know what? I gotta, I gotta give you this much background. <laughs> Understand this, folks, because it's going to become so very important. There are so many machinations and 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 cross currents and so on involved in this plot to get Jesus dead. And what you need to understand is basically this, that Rome had this vast empire. She had divided up into all these governing provinces, and she had assigned each province to this province, to this or that individual, this or that officer. They all had two duties. All right, so if you are a Roman officer uh, over any sort of province, that's what I'm trying to say, your two responsibilities, uh, that's not going to work for me. Why is that? I'll just tell you, your two responsibilities are, number one, collect the taxes. I like to say, this is ancient Roman history, so it's hard for us to get into touch with, but if you can imagine this, what had happened is that Rome had spent itself into poverty, the government had, on the most self-serving and counterproductive uh, projects and so on, and number two, the only thing they could think of to get themselves out of hock was to tax their citizens more heavily. Now, again, that's ancient history, so it's... Hard for us to get in touch with that, I know, but I'm being facetious. But the point is, the point is, honest to goodness, number one, the Romans demanded you collect the taxes. The money has to come in. Number two, keep the peace. They had a huge empire. Their, their huge army, 350,000 standing soldiers, were, were stretched beyond the limits. And if you can't keep the peace, if we got to be... See, that wasn't a large contingent of Roman officers or Roman soldiers down there in, in Judea. It was up in Damascus uh, or down even in, uh, in, in uh, Alexandria. But if we got to be fetching soldiers here all the time, we'll find somebody else. So you got to understand that Pilate's got... Uh, he's got a boiling pot here. You see what I'm saying? And so... Uh, so what I'm saying is that in, in Judea, because Pilate had nothing but Jewish constituents there in Judea, and because, uh, like I say, he'd stepped in enough, you'll forgive me, cow pies along the way with Rome, that, that they could get him to dance to their tune. On the other hand, Herod Antipas was entirely muscled up. And, and they, they could not, they could not, uh, they had no leverage over him. Let's put it that way. Now go to Luke chapter 13. So now I pick up my story. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He claims to be one with the Father. Uh, his enemies pick up stones to stone him. He's in danger. So he makes the short trip down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, about 15 miles, crosses over the Jordan River. Now he's in Perea. He's in the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. He's doing it because he's wise as a serpent. But his enemies are trying to lure him back. And so they say, look at verse 31, on that very day some Pharisees came saying to him, now these Pharisees don't belong in Perea. This is barely, pretty much Gentile territory. But they made the trip across. And by the way, it's very clear here in Luke that tens of thousands of people from Judea crossed over to Perea and are following Jesus to hear him teach and, and to bring their sick and so on. So, so, and that only more thoroughly angers the Pharisees because they're in charge of all things Jewish and here's this rogue and people are following him over there and so on. So they come over 
And they say in verse 31, get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, that's Herod Antipas, okay? And the fact of the matter is, this is a ploy. This is a cheap trick. You need to understand it. Uh, they were not concerned for Jesus, and, Her and he was there because Herod was far less of a danger to him than, than Pontius Pilate was. And Jesus responds by saying, it's not going to work. I'd love to walk you through the next two verses, but, well, let me just say this. Look what he says. Okay, I can't leave it alone. Uh, <laughs> honest to goodness, folks, learn to read the Bible in terms of its own culture. And one of the, one of the realities, and, and consciously factor this in, into your understanding of the Bible, one of the most important and really kind of interesting dynamics of the Bible is that it was written for an oral culture. Now, for that reason, that it was going to be read aloud, and they had no punctuation marks, and you couldn't depend on the inflection of the reader or whatever. Whatever you wanted, a parenthesis or emphasis or, or question and so on, had to be built into the words on the page. And they had a number of very clever literary nuances or clue, ways to build certain uh, nuances into the, into the actual words on the page. That makes sense to you? All right, one of the ways in which in the Hebrew... And remember now, this is New Testament, but the New Testament writers wrote in Greek, but they thought in Hebrew. This is a Hebrew book. And one of the ways in which you see it is, in the Old Testament, again and again, one of the ways in which you, you, you uh, insinuate either emphasis or fullness or in, in, is, is with what's called the uh, uh, numerical progression. Have you ever heard of this? You know it, because you can finish this. Six things the Lord hates, what? Yea, seven. Three things I don't understand, indeed, four. For three transgressions of Moab, indeed, four, four. It's always X, X plus one. And, and, and the point is not that God only hates those seven things. It's that he really hates those seven things. It's always fullness or emphasis. So now, hear what Jesus says. It makes all the sense in the world. And his, he says in verse uh, 32, he said to them, you go tell that fox, Herod Antipas, as if they were going to, they had no contact with Herod Antipas, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I'll be perfected. And he repeats it, nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and, uh, and the day following. So again, what he is saying is, I'm not going to fall for your little trick. I'm not going to come wandering back over there so you can do me harm. When the time is full, when the Father's time is full, I'm going to do it today and tomorrow and on the third day. So when the time is full, that's all he means. But then he goes on and he makes a stunning promise. And that's why we are in this text. And I'm going to read it to you. In verse 34, Jesus says, now I want you to get the scene Imagine uh, Jesus is, is teaching in Perea. If you had been there that day, you certainly would have noticed these blue clad. You could see a Pharisee about a mile away because their blue was brighter and their fringe was longer and their turban was higher and so on. So here come, the, and their neck is probably a little red. And so, I mean, you know, they're upset. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not accusing them of being from North Carolina or anything. I'm saying they're, but at any rate, you see them coming and you're saying to yourself, What's this about? They don't belong here. And they come marching up, little gaggle of Pharisees, and they have this great show of, and, 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 and Jesus says to them, and it's really stunning because Jesus is going to weep over the city of Jerusalem, but he's in Perea. And he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, folks, this is a stunning promise. All right, got to really be quick now because i got to get this done tonight. But know this. That last phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is a messianic prophecy, and it is specifically the psalm of messianic inauguration. It's, it's where God teaches his covenant people 
how to receive the Messiah when he appears. And they are taught to cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As a matter of fact, might I say, there is a verse in Psalm 118 that everybody in the room knows by heart. Can you tell me what it is? <laughs> if I start it, you can finish it. Everybody knows this, this, this verse. <laughs> this is the day. <laughs> now, listen, I love the verse too. And I know it's a good habit to just every morning throw the drapes back and say, this is the day. Help yourself. But that's not what the psalmist is talking about. He's talking about one day. You know what he's talking about? You know what he's talking about? He's talking about March 29th, 33 AD. He's talking about the triumphal entry. He's talking about the day when Messiah appears. He's talking about the day when that promise that was made way back there in the garden, Genesis 3, finally comes to pass and the seed of the woman appears and offers himself as the Savior of Israel and the world. That's what he's talking about. As a matter of fact, that's, that's, uh, the, the, the point is when he says this is the day which the Lord has made, what he means is only God could make this happen. We have waited for this promised deliverer, only God. This is the day which only God could make, and therefore we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Do you remember that when Jesus did ride in, and we'll talk about it tomorrow morning, but when Jesus did ride into the city, and in point of fact, uh, they cried out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and Jesus' enemies tried to get him to stop. Jesus said, remember, if they don't say it, the very stones will cry out. Why? Because this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And they were taught to receive Messiah with the song, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, by the way, there's, there's uh, one other instruction there in verse 25. Psalm 118, 25. I'll just quote it to you. I've got to be quick. Uh, the psalm says that they were to cry out, Save now. Can you say that in Hebrew? Hoshana, exactly. Save now. And uh, we've taken that word Hosanna and made it into sort of a praise word. It doesn't necessarily mean it. It means something, folks. It means receive him as your only hope of salvation. That's how they were taught to receive. Now, here's what I want you to see. And I gotta, now I've got to be quick. In point of fact, about uh, this would have been somewhere in maybe January or February. Somewhere maybe four months before the triumphal entry, Jesus makes a stunning promise. And he says to those Pharisees who have come with murder in their hearts, he says, your house is left to you desolate and you're not going to see me until you receive me as Messiah, until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, if you'd have been there that day, one of the listeners and you heard Jesus make that promise to those blue-garbed Pharisees, you'd have said, I guarantee you, you'd have said, that's not going to happen. Those are the most important men in the Jewish world. They despise Jesus. The, the Jewish world checks their mind at that door right there. Those men, they are not going to let that happen. And yet several weeks later, Jesus rides into the city, what we know is the triumphal entry, and they throw their garments down, and they cry, Hoshana, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this is the exercise for the next half hour. Hold on to your hats. How in the world did that happen? I think we can trace the very deliberate, creative, clever steps, wise as a serpent, that Jesus took to make that happen. And I want to walk you through it rather quickly. All right? Now, where you got to start. So I'm asking, how did Jesus contrive to make sure that the city would, in fact, welcome him as king? And uh, you got to start with the raising of Lazarus. Oh, how I love this story. But go to John chapter 11 just quickly. And let me, uh, again, you know this story well. Jesus is still in Perea. He's still over there on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And somebody comes and says, this one whom you love is sick. Oh, I'd love to develop this. But Jesus deliberately tarries and shows up where Lazarus has already been in the grave for four days. Now, I believe that that's deliberate and strategic. 
And I'll tell you why. For two reasons. Number one, when a man died, Lazarus, all right, now let's get the lay of the land. Lazarus is a wealthy man living with his two sisters, his family, uh, on, in the little village of Bethany. Very important. Bethany is about a mile and a half from Jerusalem to the east. If you leave Jerusalem on the east, you're going to go past the Temple Mount, down into the Kedron Valley, up on the Mount of Olives, and just on the backside of the Mount of Olives, just a little south, is the village of Bethany. It's outside the Sabbath zone. It's just beyond the Sabbath, but it's, a, it's, it's very, very close. And Lazarus was a wealthy man, and uh, when a man died, there was a cycle of mourning. And it was a weekly, then a month, then a year. I won't get into it over much other than to say that the high day of mourning, you would, you would sit with his family. His family would today call it uh, sitting ship, of course, but, and it seems to be very hoary-headed for a week. But the high day was the fourth day. That's when you would, if there were only one day you'd get out there, you'd be there on the fourth day. And I'll tell you why. Because you could attend, listen, it was unspeakably important to care, I mean to physically participate in the burial preparation of one who had died who was close to you. And it was going to cost you something. You were going to render yourself temporarily impure and you're going to have to pay a sign. But if you love this person, you're going to, and so, and so by, by the Jewish rites of burial, you know what? I told you a minute ago, learn to read the Bible in terms of his own culture. Study that culture. And, and two places to start, honestly, are marriage and burial. That, that's fascinating. But marriage and burial in that culture are so different from w the way we do it, and yet it shows up so often in word pictures and narratives. But understand the way they buried and the way they married. It's really fascinating. It's really fun stuff. But I'll just tell you this much about it, that... When a man died, uh, his body, especially a man such as Lazarus, who's obviously very wealthy, and they have a family tomb, a cave, and his body would be immediately uh, 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 washed and, uh, and laid on a stone table. And for three days, you could come and just help wrap his body. And what they would do, generally, there were other... Uh, it wasn't absolutely standard, but basically they would wrap his body in strips of cloth, and they would soak that cloth in perfume, and they would wrap his body. Not because they're trying to, the, the Jews did not then, and they don't to this day, do anything to retard the decay. So they're not trying to, they're trying to keep the smell down, because you want to be able to attend to it for three days, and they do nothing to retard the decay, and the body begins to smell quite quickly. And by the end of the, th so you wrap it in those perfumes just to kind of keep the smell down. By the end of the third day, and you, the first day is when he dies, doesn't matter what time of day, then the second day and the third day. And as the sun goes down on the third day, you're going to roll the stone over the tomb and chink it with mud and because and, you want to keep the smell in. The tombs were generally in living spaces. They didn't have cemeteries out all by themselves. Generally, remember where Jesus was crucified nearby, there was a garden, and in the garden, there were, whenever you read about a garden in the Bible, it's a hobby farm. It's an agricultural installation, okay? It's not a rose garden. But there was a little farm, and in the farm, in the garden, was a newly dug tomb. That's what you did. You would take a hillside in your property just outside of town. You couldn't bury in town. You couldn't farm in town. So you'd have a little farm out here, and now in the hillside, you'd dig a cave as a tomb, but again, because you're going to be working in that tomb over the next years as that, as that body rots and so on, you're going, to, you're going to seal it. Well, get the picture. Jesus deliberately arrives on the fourth day. I think it's so big because what's going to happen is this. You know the story. They go out to the tomb. Jesus demands that the stone be rolled away. Martha, I always say he was kind of the Martha Stewart of her own day. Can you still get away with that? I don't know if that's good to say or not. But at any rate, <laughs> the point is she was very much the Little Miss Homemaker, right? I mean, as we see her that all the time. And it was an awful faux pas to subject your guests to what's going to come rolling out of that tomb. And because you just think, that body has been in there now for several hours, all little tiny space, cooped up, smelling awfully and so on. And you can bet. That's why she says, no, Lord, he's, it's been four days. He stinks. Don't do that. Well, I think that's important. Because, you see, one thing about that stink is this. It can't be counterfeited. So there's absolutely no denying that this man is dead. 
And as they rolled that tomb back, uh, that stone, I think probably people were backing up and covering their noses and so on. Probably took a minute to oh, get the smell out. But then Jesus says, Lazarus, come out of there. The Bible says he's bound hand and foot. Remember that? I picture him just going, you know, I picture him kind of. <laughs> I don't know how he got off that table. He may have skinned himself. But, but, but the point is, folks, you go to a funeral, and as you leave that day, the guest of honor is at the garden gate saying, thanks for being here. You know, I mean, you're going to go home talking about that. And the raising of Lazarus, folks, the raising of Lazarus absolutely and deliberately set Jerusalem and Judea on its ear. And very quickly, John gives us three results, and they're all very important. They're in John eleven forty-five 45 to 57, but I'll just quote them for you. You can see them there. Number one... Some of the Jews hint whenever John uses the, John, the fourth gospel, when he uses the word Jews, he means the leadership. Maybe one exception, I'm not even convinced there. So he means, clearly, he means the Pharisaic Sanhedrin leadership. Some of the Jews who had come and seen what happened that day believed. Hey, that's enough. Others went to the Sanhedrin and specifically to Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the high priest. We'll talk about him tomorrow. He is the great villain of this story. He is a man of absolutely no character, a man, just a villain in every way. But he has been the high priest for 18 years. He runs things Jewish. He's totally, totally in thrall with the Romans. But they went to Caiaphas, and he convened the Sanhedrin, that body of local self-government, religious self-government, and John eleven fifty three, 53, they took counsel to put Jesus to death. As a matter of fact, verse 57 says that they put out a notice that if anybody knew where Jesus was, they were to tell him so they could arrest him. Folks, understand this. Get this in your head. Throughout the remainder of Jesus' life, just a few weeks, this is all happening just a, 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 three, a couple, three weeks before the Passover at which Jesus will die. But all throughout the rest of the drama, Jesus is a fugitive. You need to understand that. He's on the run. The most important and powerful men in all of Jewry have determined and announced to the world that they are determined to, to, to arrest him and to kill him. So Jesus is a fugitive. You can't overstate how circumspect and how clever he has to be. And you can watch it unfold. It's just marvelous to see how Jesus, because he's wise as a serpent, carries himself and how circumspect he is. So number one, uh, the, the Sanhedrin determined to kill him. Number two, in verse uh, 45, it says that, no, 54, in, in John eleven fifty four, 54, it says that Jesus took his disciples to a little village called Ephraim. Ephraim. He goes to Ephraim. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Tremendous cleverness in that. But number three, and this is so important, John 11, verses 55 and 56 says this. John tells us that a lot of people went up to Jerusalem before the Passover to attend to rites of purification. So if you had, had a disease or a sore or you'd contact with a human dead body or whatever and you wanted to keep the feast, you had to go up a little early, go to the temple, Present yourself to the priest, attend to the rites of purification. So the city began to grow in population several days before the Passover season as these people came. And then John says this. It's so lovely in verse 56. It says, as they stood about in the temple, they said to one another. Now what he means is they were whispering because they knew that the Pharisees were really angry, but they were excited. So as they stood around the temple, they said to one another, do you think Jesus will not come to the feast? Now, this is important. As a result, I want you to factor this in. As a, it's, it's, I'm not making anything up. As a result of the raising of Lazarus, the city of Jerusalem is fairly a Twitter with the question, do you think the Nazarene will have the nerve to show up this year? All right, now, Jesus takes his disciples to a place called Ephraim. Now we've got to follow the notes here, follow the, the map. So, uh, let me pick it up here. I'm hurrying here. Now, can you see this? Uh, here's where it's really important to harmonize the Gospels. Because in Luke 17, all right, let me, let me back up. John 11:54 leaves Jesus specifically in Ephraim. 
Ephraim, you know what? I got to tell you this too. <laughs> I think, I really do, in John chapter 4, when Jesus, after several months of ministry down in Judea, John the Baptist has been put in prison, Jesus decided to go up to Galilee, but he says, I need to go through Samaria. Folks, I think, and you, this won't sit well with you, but I don't think it was in order to win that woman to himself, though he was careful to do that when the opportunity suggested itself. I don't know that he knew that woman was there. I, don't, I think it was important for Jesus to establish some standing in Samaria. Because, you see, the standard way by which Jews had to travel from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south is all the way around down the rift. The much faster route was the ridge, but because the Samaritans hated the Jews, it was dangerous. Several times, Jesus is going to... Remember in John chapter 7, when his brothers make fun of him? This is the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, they said, aren't you going to go up? And he said, you can go up any time. So they went up. And then it says, after that, he went up, as it were, secretly. I think he went through Samaria, because at feast seasons... It was very, very dangerous for Jews to pass through Samaria. But Jesus had good standing there, and I think he did it very deliberately. He's going to do the same thing now. So now, in, I go back to it in, in John 11, and verse 54, he goes to Ephraim. Now, Ephraim, I don't know, can you see this up here? Ephraim is a little village, and there are a couple of places which claim to be it, but just suffice it to say that it's just north of Jerusalem. It, it says this, he went to Ephraim, which was on the frontier. Now what it means is it was right between Judea to the south and Samaria to the north. And all of this is the province of, of, of Pontius Pilate, but, but the locals don't get along at all. Remember that woman at the well? We, we don't have any, the Jews don't have any dealing with us Samaritans. Well, Jesus goes, and because it's feast season, the Passover is on the horizon. It's especially dangerous. So the Jews are going to stay away from Ephraim. It's right smack on the border. It's, it's got one, he's got one foot in Samaria. And he tarries there for some weeks. Now let me just tell you something. Jesus was a Galilean. His whole life he lived in Galilee. As a boy, every year he went to Passover. He knew well the habits of the Galilean Jews when it comes to to going down to Passover. He's going to make hay with it. Because what happens is, John eleven fifty four says that he was in Ephraim. Now we go to Luke, and Luke picks the story up. Now, I'm trying to explain something here in a map. I think you know this, but Judea to the south, Samaria to the north uh, of Judea, and Galilee further north. And I can't get lost in this, but let me just tell you something. Beginning about 100 years before Christ, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people. There was a, there was a family in, in, in ruling in Israel at this time by the name of the Hasmoneans. Remember these guys, the Maccabees? And one of them went up and captured Galilee because it was too crowded down around Jer Jerusalem. And hundreds of thousands of Jews settled up in Galilee, So that by, including, by the way, uh, a couple of families who settled in Nazareth. One had a son named Joseph. The other had a daughter named Mary, for instance. But they were Bethlehemites, right? They belonged down in Judah, but they settled up there. Because there was so much work up there, and it was, oh, I could go on and on. Galilee is just the most, uh, Josephus calls it, one section is explicitly, but I think it applies, calls Galilee the ambition of nature. If nature could be what she wants to be, it would be Galilee. It's just beautiful rain and sloping hills and plenty of farmland and open, and it's just, it's just stunning. Well, there were many more Jews living in Galilee than there were down in Judea. So these Jews, would, would tens of thousands of them, would make their way down to Jer Jerusalem for, for the Passover. Well, Jesus understood their habit. So here, again, uh, Galilee to the north. Uh, and on the, uh, the Galilee, the, the southern region of Galilee is what's called the Jezreel Valley. And it's the most important valley on the face of the earth, but I won't go into it. But here's the thing. Can you see this? Luke 17, 11 says, well, let me back up. Jesus knew the habit of the, of the Galilean Jews and the habits. And, and, and their habit was to make their way down into the Jezreel Valley out of the scores of villages and towns and cities and so on up there in the Galilee. They would make their way down and they 
would, would now there were two routes, and here I'm going to give it to you. There were two routes by which they might have made their way down to Jerusalem. The one is called, are you ready for this? Whoop. I always say there will be a quiz. It's called the Bema Seed. I'm sure it'll come up, believe me, but no, probably not. But, but the point is, the, uh, the easy route is called the Ridge, R-I-D-G-E route, because it just, it's, it's one, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's 60 miles, and it's up and down, and foreign regions to the next, and if we had to walk it, it'd kill us. But in that day, that was an easy walk. That's how you wanted to go, the Ridge route. But the problem was that it passed right through Samaria. And so almost, and we know very well, Jesus is going to follow this route, the other route was this. Now watch this. They would gather there in the Jezreel Valley, the Arrowhead. They'd make their way down the Herod Valley, cross the Jordan River, and then make their way down the rift. This is the Jordan Rift, that cleft in the face of the earth, all right? So they're going to make their way. This is called the Rift Route because it's going to go down to the Jordan, cross over because that's the border of Samaria, and then they're going to make their way down, reford the river at Jericho, and make their way up the backside of the Mount of Olives, right past Bethany. So that's the, the rift route, and that's the way they normally go. Does that make sense to you? This is important, trust me. All right? Here's the point. Luke 17, 11, and I give it to you here. Matter of fact, I give it to you in the King James, because that's the real Bible. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Forget that. It's a good translation. And here's a curious reality. A lot of translations kind of mess with this verse because it seems so confusing. Because it says simply that as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Well, if you go through Samaria and then Galilee, you got Jerusalem in the rear view mirror. And that's so confusing that a lot of translations put something about through the coasts of or along the coasts of and so on. It is twice explicit in the Greek, the case ending and the preposition. He passed through the midst of Samaria and the midst of Galilee. What's going on? Jesus is wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. i got to cut to the chase. Here's what happens. It's explicit. I'm telling you, I'm not making this up. Jesus, after the raising of Lazarus, he set the city fairly a twitter. Now he goes and tarries. He knows how long it's going to take him. So he waits until the time is right, and then Jesus takes the 12, and he goes through Samaria. Again, he's got standing. He can get away with this. And he goes through Samaria on his way up to the Valley of Jezreel. Now, when he gets to the Valley of Jezreel, quite obviously, oh, I need to tell you one other thing. Because it was dangerous no matter which route, which route you took. The rift route was always dangerous, but even if you, I'm sorry, the ridge route was. Even if you took the rift, you were skirting the desert and there are robbers and so on, so you never go alone. And they always go in large bands of Passover pilgrims. And the men are on the outside and the women are on the inside and so on with the kids and so on. This is what happened when Jesus was 12. They both thought him to be in the company. Remember that? They got a day out before they realized he wasn't there. Leave that alone. The fact is that Jesus knows this. So Jesus goes north and descends into the valley of Jezreel out of the hill country of uh, Samaria or Ephraim and quite clearly falls in with one of those bands of Passover pilgrims. And you can imagine the excitement. And he joins them and he's going to travel with them for several days. Now only Luke and John tell it so far, but at this point Matthew and Mark both pick up the story and they talk. This is when he healed ten lepers. And only one came back to thank him. This is when he, he confronted a, a, a rich young ruler came and said, what must I do to enter the kingdom? And Jesus told him to sell everything. This is when, uh, when he, got, this is when he, he uh, taught on divorce and deliberately confronted the Pharisaic teaching on divorce, Matthew 19. This is when he uh, got to uh, Jericho and, number one, healed two blind men, Bartimaeus and his friend, and then... Oh, this would have been so provocative. Invited himself to lunch at the home of a taxpayer. All of that's happening on this trip. Does that make sense to you? So get the picture. Jesus waits. Then he falls in with one of these Passover, bands of Passover pilgrims. They're going to make their way down. It's going to take them four or five days, maybe six days. 
You're not going to hurry on this trip. All along the way, Jesus is being very much the provocateur. He's doing miracles. He's challenging Pharisaic teaching. He's having lunch with a taxpayer and so on. The police. If I'd have been in the next group back and heard the Nazarene was up there, I'd have hot-footed it up there. You know what I'm saying? I would think this group is growing. And he's healing people along the way and so on. Ah, but John chapter 12, verse 1 this is where we're going to harmonize once again. All right, so Jesus comes down, John 12, 1. Luke has him going through Samaria and Galilee and falling in. Matthew and Mark has him along the way telling all, do, doing all these remarkable miracles and so on. Then John says this, six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany. Six days, I haven't got time to develop it. I've written a major paper on it. I've, I've duked it out with Harold Hone over this. I just want you to know, but uh, I never did talk him into it. I've got to confess, but, uh, but he was my professor. But, but at any rate, here's the point. Six days before the Passover is Friday. So, and this is not accidental. Jesus is wise as a serpent. So on Friday afternoon, Jesus contrives... Here you come. You've been with Jesus for several days. There's so much excitement. You're just a buzz. Everybody's excited and telling these stories. You're making your way up the long trek from Jericho, 900 feet below sea level, to the Mount of Olives, 2,700 feet above sea level. You're making that trek up. And just before you crest, you're getting excited now because just over the hill is, is of course, the Temple Mount and so on. And just before you crest the, the, uh, the backside of the Mount of Olives, there's a little road that goes off to the south to Bethany. And you watch. Jesus is very much the center of attention, has been for days. And now you're about to go into the city. It's Friday. You're kind of hustling. You don't want to get caught outside the city. And interestingly enough, Bethany is just outside what's called the Sabbath zone. Very simply, you know, the Bible says that on Shabbat you're to do no work. But it doesn't define work very much, but the Jews couldn't leave that alone. And so they have all sorts of protocols of what constitutes work. One of them is, and there's probably some somewhat reasonable, is that you can't travel more than a Sabbath day journey. It's about a mile and two-fifths. The way I've seen it explained is that they calculated how much land an ox could plow in a day, and that's how far you could walk. However you like it, it was a pretty standard. And what the, the rabbis would do is they would go on every, every major road leaving a city, they'd go out a mile and two-fifths, and put a marker. Now, by the way, the thought is that you can move around freely in the zone. In other words, it's not like you've got to count your steps and walk a mile and two-fifths and sit down and wait for the sun to go down. It's, it's, it's that you can move around freely. But if you are inside the Sabbath zone of a city, you can't leave it until the sun goes down. And if you're outside, you can't come in. All right, now put it all together. I'm not making this up. Jesus made a promise. You're not going to see me until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You'd have been there, you'd have said, it's not going to happen. It did happen. How did it happen? Jesus was wise as a serpent, raises Lazarus from the dead, goes to a little village called Ephraim, waits there very deliberately until the timing is right, goes, falls in with one of those bands of Passover pilgrims, spends several days with them, doing miracles, very much the provocateur, now on Friday afternoon, sometime on Friday, we're all making our way, we're all excited into the city. We see as Jesus goes down to Bethany. Now know, we know very well that he's going there to keep the Sabbath. Today is Friday. It's the day of preparation. We're all thinking about how we're going to keep the Sabbath. We have to make everything ready. So we watch. He's going down to keep the Sabbath. We go into the city. Do you see the point Hundreds of excited people go into the city on Friday afternoon. What is everybody in the city asking one another? Is Jesus coming? Several hundred people go into the city. I like to say they get their war holly in 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? They, they're the star of the show because they have a twofold message. Now get this. They go into the city bearing a twofold message. Number one, Jesus is coming to the feast. Oh, he is coming to the feast. We've been traveling with him. He's on his way. He's got the 12. He's been doing miracles and so on. But there's more. He is coming to the feast. And number two, he'll be here Sunday morning. 
Because, you see, he stopped in Bethany. And we know very well he wouldn't come in on the Shabbat. And there's no use to come in uh, late on Saturday. So he'll be here Sunday morning. Now, folks, you have to understand that this is Passover. And what is every Jewish heart thinking about, do hearts think? And what is every Jewish person thinking about at Passover time? They're remembering when God delivered them from a hideous Gentile overlord in fulfillment of an explicit promise, Genesis 15. Well, guess what? There's a new hideous Gentile overlord. It's called Rome. And guess what? We got a promise. We got a 70-week 70, 70 clock ticking in Daniel chapter 9. We know very well Messiah has to come soon. And why not at Passover? And here is this Nazarene, and I know that, that, that our leaders, the Pharisees, insist he's an imposter, but good heaven, what do you think? Can you still use the phrase degrees of separation? What must have been the degrees of separation at that time between virtually anybody and somebody who had been healed? Could there be anybody who didn't have a third cousin or a neighbor who's, you know, a workman or whatever, was, was blind? or what? And, and, and so you're saying to yourself, look, I'm sick up to here of Rome. We know that Messiah has to come soon. This, this Nazarene has been insisting he is Messiah. Our leadership says he's an imposter. But boy, oh boy, it'd be nice to be out from under the heel of Rome. And I think uh, one by, you know, it's interesting. And by the way, in that regard, if you anticipated, if you even contemplated going to battle against a hideous enemy such as Rome, would it be an encouragement to follow somebody who could raise you from the dead, for heaven's sakes? Lazarus is walking around town. So here's what happens. And it's so fascinating to me that in John chapter 12, in John's telling of the triumphal entry, he introduces it this way. John 12, I think it's verse 12. He says this. So when those who had come to the feast that year, now listen to this, heard that Jesus was coming, how did they hear? Jesus alerted them. He contrived to send several hundred excited travelers into the city, and you can just imagine how like wildfire this would spread from family to family. And without any concert, without any prearrangement, without any public notices, without any internet, just one family after the other said, Let, there's, there's only one road he's going to come in on from Bethany to Jerusalem. Let's go greet him. And on Sunday morning, you know, and with this I'm done. We'll, we'll pick it up with the triumphal entry in the morning. But I'll tell you something. This is real history. And there are some questions that jump off the page that nobody ever asks, and we ought to ask them. And one of them is, how did Jesus get away with this? Do you realize that at this point in history, Rome is absolutely paranoid about sedition, about pretender kings. She won't put up with it. And furthermore, the one place in her whole domain where she's had more seditious activity, seditious activity has been horribly hard to put down, is in Israel. And the one seized of the years, the year when the, when, the, when the Jews are most prone to this sort of thing, is at Passover when they're remembering the Exodus. And so the, the, the Romans are on high alert at this time. And yet Jesus rides into town. How did he get away with that? There's only one answer, and it's the biblical answer. I can point you to really bogus answers by people who claim to believe the Bible. One, uh, watch this one where they, 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 they insist that really it was probably just 30 or 40 people, but they were so excited they misread the crowd and, they, and so on the gospel has got it all wrong. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. The Romans were looking for 30 or 40 people. They had, they had soldiers dressed up as peasants and worshipers and so on, just looking for anybody talking sedition. And yet the whole city begins to throw down their garments and cry Hosanna and cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How'd that happen? Oh, I'm sorry, how did Jesus get away with it? There's only one answer, and that's what the Bible says. The whole city, what are the Romans going to do? What are the Jews going to do? You're going to arrest the whole city? The whole city exploded in happy welcome as Jesus rode in on Sunday morning. Now listen, understand what's going on there. The triumphal entry, and I give a title to each, uh, the days, and Sunday I want you to think of as a day of messianic presentation. Because Jesus is deliberately, dramatically, intentionally offering himself to that generation as their Messiah King. 
That's what's going on. This is a day of stunning, remarkable, public presentation of himself as king. Does that make sense to you? Now, it's an exciting day. We'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow. Basically, what happens is that he rides into the city. Oh, I'd love to walk you through it. And most people haven't gone to the Eastern Gate. He wouldn't have gone to the Eastern Gate. For one thing, there probably wasn't an Eastern Gate. If there was an Eastern Gate, he certainly didn't have access to it. He would have gone to the Southern Gate where all the people were because he was here. And I think what happens is he rides over the hill, and it's about a mile and a quarter up the side of the hill. And Matthew says that the whole side of the hill is just covered with people there to welcome him as king. And I think it probably takes him virtually all day just to make his way down. He had to go down to the Cadron Valley, find a gate in the south, make his way up the Central Valley, that broad ceremonial walkway. And then the Bible says he comes up to the temple, and Mark says that he looked into the temple and went back. And I think basically the whole day was given just to the excitement of this, this, this entire city as they erupted in happy welcome Accepting him, you know, in in Second uh, Kings ten nine, a man by the name of Jehu is appointed king by one of Elisha's sons of the prophets, and when he's appointed king, what do his he's a general in the army, but when he's anointed king, what do all of his soldiers do immediately? Remember, they throw their garments down in front of him. That's how. You welcome a king in that culture. And they are, now, I want to send you home with a question, and we're going to pick it up in the morning. And that question is very simply, given Sunday, why Friday? Because it is absolutely true that on Sunday morning, this city erupted in happy welcome of Jesus as king. Jesus made it happen. I've seen so many representations of this where Jesus is riding in and he's kind of going, oh, who the thought of this? Oh, that's good. That's wonderful. Jesus made this happen. He had said to those people, you're not going to see me until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You can trace the clever steps by which he made sure that that city, John 12, 12, would be alerted to the fact that he's coming. And given the dynamics of that weekend and all that had gone on in his life, he anticipated that the city would, in spite of, in defiance of the Roman and Jewish leadership, rush to welcome him as king. That's exactly what happened. The day of messianic presentation. By Friday, that same city is crying out, we'll not have this man to rule over us, give us Barabbas. Given Sunday, why Friday? It's a legitimate question. We'll talk about it in the morning. All right, let me have a word of prayer with you. Thank you. Father, we do thank you for the time together. We thank you for the marvelous, marvelous story we have to tell. It deserves a far better telling than we can give it. But we thank you so much, Father, for the great detail and uh, just the the drama that's before us. And help us as we seek to understand it. I pray that you would uh, embolden and strengthen each one of us uh, for a weekend of study. Thank you for it. Go before us. We'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen.